thank you for coming. It's uh, very flattering to me that you would all come. It looks like we have a standing room only audience, but there are some seats in front. So if anyone wants to move up, uh, please, please do. Um, I first got to know Ken when we were both on the NASA Advisory Council, and I came to admire him as a skillful leader of complicated human beings, as well as technology. And then subsequently I visited IHMC in Pensacola and learned a bit about what this wondrous institution is doing. And let me just say that uh, here in Florida you are nurturing an entirely new branch of science, a combination of psychology and uh, information science and high technology. And I think in the future you will be very, you will be able to say, it all started here. So he's running a, he's created a very fine institution, brought some wonderful people like Ro Rogoski, whom you just heard from, and there will be more. And so it's really an honor for me to be here and speak before uh, this audience as well as at Pensacola where I spoke last year. Now the topic of my subject today is entitled The Climate Threat We Can Beat. And this is uh, the subtitle, of course, help, let's help our children put off the worst aspects of climate change if we can. And it presents a few ideas about how to doing so. Now, it was an article that by great good luck we published in the American Foreign Policy Journal Foreign Affairs in uh, April and May of this year. And it turned out, again by great good luck, timing is everything, that this article summarized the reasoning behind a new international initiative in climate change mitigation that the U.S. is leading, one of the few that has uh, undertaken. And uh, in fact, our article was used in the briefing book uh, that President Obama gave to the G8 conference in May, in which he asked the G8 to join the Cli uh, Climate Change and Clear Air Coalition, which I will explain to you. Uh, but first, before I do that, I have to go through a lot of the reasoning that led us to write this paper, but more specifically, the scientific and policy community to be able to recommend to the community uh, this new initiative. And so I'm going to try to see if I can get this to work. The first thing I'm going to do is tell you about climate change in the past. And uh, you all know the term global warming, and you hear the term the global temperature, and you actually wonder what, it's going, what it really means, and what, what does climate change really mean? How does it affect different people? So uh, about this time last year, my colleagues from the physics department at the University of Berkeley uh, in California decided that they would do what high energy physicists do better than climate scientists, and that is reduce vast quantities of data. So they actually laid their uh, hands on about a billion measurements of surface temperatures taken uh, at the surface of the Earth from the year 1800 on, and they just plotted them. And uh, here's the format of the plot. There's a map of the Earth, and where you see color, that's where in the year 1800 that surface temperatures were being measured. And uh, so then they uh, computed from that, they just took all the measurements and showed how they evolved over time. And what they did was show the difference between the mean temperature that each region observed in the periods 1940 to 1960 or 70, and they showed the deviation. If it's above, it's red, if it's below, it's blue. So in the year 1800, uh, the, earth, the parts of the Earth that we knew about were cooler. And now I'm just going to start this thing, if I can get it to go. There we, oops. And so, let's see. No, how do we... Let's see. I figured out how to get this thing going. Is it going to go? There we go. Now we're in 1803. And at the bottom, this curve at the bottom is the global average temperature, or at least the average measured from all the measurements. And so we're in 1818 or 19. It's cool, but you can see the temperatures fluctuating up and down. And the regions are different. 
Each region sees a different thing. And this is, of course, what we know about the climate. It's variable, it changes. So the question is, can you perceive an overall trend? Okay, so, and as you see, as time is passing, the area over which we knew the temperature is growing. Uh, at the bottom, those of you who can, are close can see the gray surrounding the blue curve at the bottom. And that's, the gray is the error in this measurement. The dispersion, as you can see, it gets better and better. And by around 1900, we knew how to measure temperature well enough that there was very little spread in the global average temperature. But this is the temperature that people quote when they talk about two degrees, three degrees, three quarters, whatever. Uh, and, but this is what it really means underneath it all as you see this plot uh, working itself out over time. The different regions, some are, sometimes they're warmer, sometimes they're hotter. Uh, we're about to come to the Dust Bowl. Uh, it's right about in there. The Midwest got, suddenly got wet for about, hot for about five years. Now in the period 1940 to 70, when the climate was remarkably stable. And uh, soon now we're going to hit the run up in the last 30 or 40 years uh, in global temperature, which we think is due to the greenhouse effect. So, but you can see it's highly variable that different folks would experience different things at different times and places. Uh, and so you really need to look at the overall trend uh, to see what's happening. Okay, so there we are at the end. And uh, if you look at the scale at the end, the temperature, this is land surface temperature, has risen about one degree centigrade, about uh, uh, 1.8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit relative to the 40s and, and uh, 50s and maybe one and a half degrees or so relative to the, the pre-industrial period back in the 1800s. So that's the past. That's what's happened already. And let me just say that if they had done the same thing for the oceans, which was very hard to do at that time, not enough measurements, uh, you'd have gotten a smaller number because it takes a long time, as anyone who's boiled an egg, to know that it takes a long time for water to... Uh, warm up. So let's go on to the talk then. What about the future? As Yogi Berra said, uh, predictions are very hard, especially when they're about the future. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, here are some very crude plots that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put together. Forecasts of temperature going forward throughout this century and you see a number of envelopes there, the four or five colored lines uh, that, uh, in which they postulated various, various courses for society to pursue. Uh, and if we, and the one that we, the curve that we're on at the present time is called business as usual. And that's this global temperature which masks all the variability that you saw in that movie. And, uh, but at the end of the century, uh, if we continue along this line, we're expected to get about four and three quarters degrees centigrade warming. What we've seen at the moment, when we include the ocean into the temperature projection, is about three quarters of a degree centigrade, about one degree Fahrenheit. That's what we've seen thus far. And that was what's underlying that plot. The diplomats have decided that things are going to get dangerous for us if we reach two degrees above pre-industrial. So basically one and a quarter more than what we've got. Uh, today's, I'm going to argue that today's greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, much less those that we put in in the future, already commit us to 2.4 degrees. So we can't achieve what the diplomats said we should be able to. And uh, so the question then will be, um, how do we deal with this situation? And it's a practical question, it's not an ideological question. And I'm going to discuss some of the goals for practical action and some of the reasons why there's been practical inaction. And I'm going to start with uh, the key question that you all want, that you probably buried somewhere in your subconscious and don't even realize you have, 
But why is it that reducing, we all know that everybody is saying that uh, it's fossil fuel burning leading to greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide. We all know that that's the reason they think for global warming. How come it's proven to be so hard? Why hasn't anything happened yet that we can talk about? Well, it's a very hard problem, okay? And uh, the California Council on Science and Technology uh, looked at what California would have to do if it were to meet its obligations uh, to the climate as were stated by the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto, uh, the Kyoto Treaty said that if you want to stabilize the climate and stop further temperature growth in the year 2100, then you must reduce our CO2 emissions by 80% in the year 2050. Then it will take the climate 50 years to respond. So what does this mean for the state of California? And the state of California enacted this into law. We're committed to trying to do this, but can we actually do it? What really has to happen? Per capita, taking into account economic and population growth, we all have to reduce our, our own emissions by 90%. So CCST studied whether, using present technologies, we could do that. And they asked, uh, e even with optimistic assumptions about the deployment of the technologies, they realized that there was no magic bullet, no single technology will work, and you have to use all the energy technologies you have available, and even then you can only do 60% of the job. So what would you have to do with available technologies? Uh, for one thing, California would need 30 new nuclear power plants, one per year after 2020. We have six at the moment, unlikely that we'll have more. New building standards by 2015, every building retrofitted by 2050, and an 80% reduction in, or an improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, 58 mile per gallon uh, fuel efficiency. That we probably can make. Uh, and use low-carbon liquid fuels, biofuels. The most important thing is to transfer as much energy uh, usage to the electrical system and then generate all electricity using renewables. Very hard. It's hard for California, a technologically advanced state in a rich country. It's going to be exceptionally hard when you imagine that the whole world has to do this. So is that really possible? Well, uh, we've had 17 years of negotiations on uh, how to deal with uh, carbon emissions. Uh, there's negotiations going on presently in Qatar, and you will hear the outcome of that. But there's been no way that we found any international agreement amongst 193 countries on how to do this. The negotiations aren't structured for rapid progress because they require consensus. And the countries have different interests, different capabilities, uh, different vulnerabilities, different desires, and they have different enthusiasm. Europe wants to do it, and the US and China, two biggest emitters, are very reluctant to join. So, um, and it's very much like the global trade negotiations, where uh, you also have 190 current countries uh, negotiating, and uh, every now and then you make some progress on global trade. Uh, when everybody can agree, uh, but it's fitful, and you can't expect rapid progress. And we aren't any longer, uh, and so the question is, uh, what do we do, and how does the world do it? But suppose, for example, by magic at Qatar, they reach an agreement and say everybody should have uh, carbon limitations, and all the countries sign up. So then they start doing it. So even if we could agree, it's still going to take decades to restructure the global energy system. Let's imagine that we have all the technologies and we have the will. It will still decades, take decades to do it, partly because the lifetime of power plants is 30 or 40 years, partly because carbon is still the principal energy source of the most rapidly growing economies, read China and India, and to uh, until about two years ago, 50% of America's electricity was generated by coal. It's the most inefficient uh, 
uh, way of generating electricity. Even if we had decided to do that, we know that energy decision making is complex and slow. Just think of all the issues of environmental impact reports and so forth that come up every time somebody wants to build a new energy project. And at the present time, all the low carbon initiatives, the renewables, uh, all require government subsidies because you can't close the business case for them yet. And so they're economically fragile. But even if we could do all of that and we stopped emitting carbon dioxide tomorrow, if we stop breathing, okay, if we stop breathing, how long would it take the climate to respond before we saw a benefit in the warming, the reduced warming rate? Because CO2 lasts such a long time in the atmosphere, it lasts about half of the carbon dioxide that we have goes into the oceans immediately and will stay there for a thousand years. The other half goes into the atmosphere and will stay there for a hundred years. So if we reduce CO2 emissions today, uh, the atmosphere will warm by, will respond by not warming as rapidly in 50 years or a hundred years time and there will still be CO2 in the oceans a thousand years from now. And so, uh, dealing with carbon dioxide is the existential problem in climate change, and it is exceptionally difficult to solve. And uh, those people that are, uh, feel uh, moralistic about the issue will just say every time we add an extra carbon molecule to the atmosphere it's going to change the climate for uh, every living thing on the earth for generations and that's certainly true. So that means we're in for climate change and the question then is what do we do to deal with it? There are two parts to it. Try to slow it down and then try to prepare for it. So some more bad news. I, I'm telling you some inconvenient truths about climate change that you don't hear and read in the newspaper. The most inconvenient one is that we're already committed to more climate change than we have seen thus far. Why is that? It's because of the other product of, uh, of fossil fuel burning, and that's air pollution. And uh, the advanced countries have managed to clear up, clean up most of the black carbon, which I'll talk about in a minute. And our air pollution consists largely of sulfate aerosols, sulfur molecules that get into the upper atmosphere, and they reflect sunlight back into space. So the greenhouse gases act like a blanket. They keep your heat radiation in. They keep you warmer for longer. But these guys, Sulfates act like little mirrors that reflect the sunlight back into space, and they are cooling. And there's a competition between the two things that we do when we burn fossil fuels. Warming through greenhouse gases and cooling through sulfate aerosols. And the warming beats the cooling by a small amount. Okay. There's another thing that we do when, when in, uh, in more uh, less developed economies and that we used to do in, in England in the 19th century, and that is create a lot of soot from open coal fires, from 100 million cooking stoves in India. Uh, that bad diesel combustion, black carbon particles, soot in the atmosphere. And you, on the right hand, you can see the black carbon cloud that hangs out over India, and follows the monsoon winds over India, and is contained there against the Himalaya mountains. And that soot turns out to be warming. So air pollution both cools us and warms us. And you have to think very carefully about the balance of all these radiation effects before uh, you proceed. But it's, I'm glad to say that through the work of my colleague Ramanathan and many others, we now understand much more about that balance. And that gives you a few levers on the problem that we didn't know we had. And makes the discussion more complex and technical, but less simplistic than the one that you read about in the newspaper. 
But here's the issue. Suppose we didn't, suppose we'd completely cleaned up the sulfate pollution. It's pretty much happened in Europe and the US. Um, then if it were all gone, we'd have received already 1.9 degrees warming, whereas the number is, what, is 0.75. And there would be some more that came out of the oceans later. So with the present load of greenhouse gases, if we got rid of the air pollution, we'd already have had 2.4 degrees as opposed to 0.75. And this doesn't take into account what we might add to the burden of greenhouse gases in the coming years, the carbon and the other pollutants. So that's the bad news. We have a Hobson's choice. The world has a Hobson's choice. China and India are going to have to clean up their vast air pollution problems because of public health and uh, because of its impact on agriculture. But when they do, they're going to expose the rest of us to more warming than we are getting at the present time. Okay? So this is the Hobson's choice. Can we, in all ethical, can we expect to cure the global warming problem by leaving the pollution in the air and causing uh, needless deaths and damage to agriculture elsewhere? So the other question that people have asked, and I'll try to go quickly through this, and if I rush through, you can ask questions later. So it looks, if we're committed to 2.4 degrees, you ought to start asking, what will the world look like when we've had two degrees of global warming? Remember that that little number is just an index for the additional energy we're putting into that complicated climate system that you saw uh, displaying itself like a bird with beautiful plumage. Uh, what would happen if we put that amount of additional energy into the atmosphere? And there have been a number of workshops that we've all been, uh, been involved with, many more than I can talk about, but the ones that we've been involved with at Scripps in particular all involve the cold regions of the Earth. We can talk about Florida in the question and answer period, but the cold regions are expected to be exceptionally vulnerable, clearly, to warming. And so we started off the first of this series of workshops at Scripps itself in 2009, had another one in Potsdam in Germany, and, and then subsequently uh, the one that received the widest degree of, uh, of publicity and so forth was held at the Vatican. And it was titled The Fate of Mountain Glaciers in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene's a new term. It's a geological term. It's a term for where human activities, anthropo, uh, are creating a new geological effort. So after much discussion of the ins and outs of the problem, uh, this group uh, said that already when the warming has only been three quarters of a degree, almost every glacier in the world is shrinking in area worldwide with the highest rates at lower elevations, uh, where of course you're the boundary between freezing and, and uh, melting is there. The widespread loss of glaciers, ice, and snow on the mountains of the tropical, temperate, and polar regions is some of the clearest evidence we have for the change in the climate system. Almost every glacier around the world is retreating at rates that the experts find have increased in the last five to ten years. So here's the, the key technical issue is that people would ask with some uh, uh, intelligent question, aren't we just recovering from the last ice age? It just ended 10,000 years and the glaciers have been retreating since then. So this whole argument about the worldwide retreat of glaciers uh, not being the end of the ice age depends on one data set that was taken in the Alps and extends back to 1860 in which they monitored the retreat in the Swiss Alps of their glaciers and what that shows is a slow retreat and then in the last 30 or 40 years, when you saw on that temperature graph the temperature rise above the mean, then they've seen a much more rapid increase in the glaciers. And so here you see a picture between 85 and 07. Uh, this is a picture taken by a very famous uh, photographer, David Brashears, who uh, works for the National Geographic and others, and has gone back and looked at historic photographs in the Himalaya Mountains 
and uh, looked where the glaciers were in earlier years, found the exact spot where the picture was taken, and taken new pictures. And I showed it because it's beautiful. But it's also important. People are doing this. Another great photographer is a fellow named James Balog, who's doing the same kind of thing. Now, the Himalayas have often been called the third pole because they are the most, after the North and South Pole, the most ice-covered part of the world. And in addition to the glaciers, of course, the snows are melting. But nobody lives at 20,000 feet altitude. Why should the rest of us be concerned? Well, it turns out that 11 of Asia's largest rivers have their headwaters in the Himalayas. And one-sixth of the world's population depends on the flow in those rivers. And in some cases, the, the seasonal flow is dominated by Himalaya snowmelt. So if the snows go away, the, the simplest, the most broadest thing you can say is that each river will find its pattern, seasonal pattern of flow changed and in significant ways that affect the people that live on rivers that you may have heard of, uh, the Ganges, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, um, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, biggest rivers in Asia. Okay? So something that's happening halfway across the world at a place where people don't live is going to affect billions of people and indirectly, the, certainly, the foreign policy and security concerns of the United States of America. So the other aspect, and this part I will hurry through, uh, the climate models all forecast that the Arctic and the Antarctic will experience the effects of, uh, of warming ahead of the rest of the world. It's an early warning system. And in fact, this is that temperature profile for the Arctic. It's basically warmed, as any native up there will tell you, and warmed at about twice the rate of, that we have seen, uh, twice the average global rate. So it's happening up in the Arctic. Um, we actually knew about the impacts on the Arctic from about the 1970s, when the US Navy sent submarines underneath the ice. Uh, and they were looking for soft spots and thin spots in the ice during the Cold War, because they would put a nuclear submarine below it and then launch missiles directly through the ice. So they wanted to, or prepared to. They, thank God they never did. But they measured the thickness of the ice. And the US Navy knew from about 1970 on that the sea ice was thinning at about 10% per decade. So this picture on the left shows you the trend over uh, the, 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 the rapid warming 30 or 40 years that I showed earlier. And on the right, uh, you will see projections that the University of Washington has made, which suggest that by 2040, at the end of the summer, uh, the poles will be completely ice, uh, polar sea will be completely ice free. Now what I want you to look at on this picture is look uh, when it's ice covered, it's white, and the white ref uh, reflects sunlight back. It's the same effect as the sulfates. That's a cooling effect. But if you replace it with darker water, that's a warming effect because it absorbs more energy. And so this is, this is a possibility of a runaway in here, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, one of the things that has happened is that the natives in, in Alaska have noticed that in the past, the sea ice used to come right up to their villages. And during the winter, when there were severe storms, the sea ice uh, shielded them from the storm surges, much as wetlands do off the coast of Louisiana. And that's no longer happening. And this is, happens to be the, the uh, iconic little village of Shishmaref in northern Alaska that is, sticks out into the Bering Sea, its highest uh, meet. Uh, elevation is seven meters, and they're getting more and more erosion from storm surges, and this little community is planning to move. So here's the case. The, uh, this slide's a little bit out of order, uh, order, but whatever you do with the Arctic sea ice, it changes the warming rate. If the sea ice uh, retreats, you get a more rapid warming rate in the Arctic. If it suddenly grows, you'll get less. And so it's a factor that amplifies the temperature changes in the Arctic. And that's what they're seeing. Here's another thing that affects. Here's black carbon from uh, ships. 
about 4% of the CO2 in the world is created by shipping. And they also have these huge trails, as seen from space, of black carbon air pollution. If that stuff gets on the ice uh, in the north, it turns the ice gray or black. And the ice absorbs more. And uh, again, the warming rate goes up. There's permafrost. There's ice underneath the ground. And it's underneath uh, uh, organic material. And there's a concern that as the permafrost melts, it's going to liberate methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's 23 times as potent per molecule as carbon dioxide. Thus far, it hasn't happened. You see methane seeps. But the big issue is that methane is a wonderful fuel for both us, it's called natural gas, and for the microbes who love to metabolize it itself. And so it's not entirely clear whether the methane releases will occur but it's in, in great volume, but it's a serious worry, and uh, people are beginning to worry about it. The tundra melt, the melting of the ethane, does affect human activities up there because uh, when the ground is frozen, it's solid, and you can drive trucks across it. And uh, when it's not, you can't. And, uh, the state of Alaska keeps track of the number of days you're allowed to uh, drive big trucks to the North Slope, and that number has gone down uh, consistently over the last 30 years or so. And besides, um, when the tundra melts, the buildings collapse. So why should we be worried about the ice again? I said why the people in the Himalaya should, uh, living in those rivers should worry. In fact, the ice in uh, Antarctica and Greenland are going to control the, the fate of the global sea level. The ice can be monitored. You've heard a lot of alarmist talk about how Antarctica is going to disappear in the next, ice will disappear in the next uh, few decades. That won't happen, but what you are observing uh, is regions of ice melt in which fresh water gets into the ocean. And the volume of that causes a significant raise in sea level, as does the surface melt, the melt of freshwater ice from Greenland. Okay? So, uh, and the people who look at this have noticed that in the last 10 years or so, there is an acceleration. Our perspective on this is not nearly very long as long as on that temperature plot, because we only have satellite measurements that go back 30 or 40 years. But nonetheless, we're seeing an increase over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and uh, for example, just this year, um, here's a satellite picture that was taken one week <coughs> apart. And the satellite measures, it's infrared measurement, but it measures where there's liquid water. Okay, And so, on the left, you'll see a plot of where there was snow and red where the surface layers of the ice had been wet, which means that the temperature was uh, above freezing. And a week later, all of Greenland was above freezing. Everything. Okay? Now, not, the Greenland ice is not going to melt right away. Okay? It's not going to happen in our children's lifetime. But... Um, if it should go, then that would lead to a several, seven meter rise in sea level. Okay. So, what have we observed thus far? Um, the sea level changes for basically two reasons. You heat the water and it expands, and you add fresh water, you add more water, and the sea level goes up. So the top plot shows the measurements from the early part of the century of the sea level is taken from uh, measurements uh, in the water itself. And then towards the end where the plot turns red, uh, that's the satellite era. And on the bottom, you see the distribution of sea level rise measured over the last 20 years uh, via the satellites. And there are two things to say. Um, the sea level rise rate is obviously accelerating. It's now three millimeters a year. Secondly, it's non-uniform. Just like the warming pictures that you saw, it's going to affect different regions and different people uh, according to this map that you can see over 20 years. 
The local relative sea level rise depends on a lot of other things besides the global number. Now, part of the problem had been that the UN panel couldn't, in 2007, couldn't figure out what the contribution of fresh water, Greenland ice melt and so forth, would be to the sea level rise. So they limited themselves to the temperature forecasts that were contained in that first diagram that I showed you, those rough forecasts. And they said, well, by the end of 2100 or so, we should get maybe 30 centimeters or 60 centimeters. But since that time, the measurements and the concern about the unexpectedly rapid ice melt now suggest that the sea level rise will be much larger than that. And California, for example, and the United Kingdom now assume 140 or 180 centimeters for planning purposes. Two meters, that's six feet. That's as much sea level rise as I am, okay? Now you might think that's, uh, well, so what does that really mean? Well, uh, what, does a, what does a two meter uh, sea level rise world look like? And here are maps of uh, both New York and Louisiana. I've seen similar maps for the state of Florida. And you can see that this isn't, in fact, this is just where the elevation of the city above sea level is, is uh, now less than two meters. So you can see that the, the battery in the southern parts of, uh, of Manhattan will go. You can see most of the dark area will go. In Louisiana, it's different, um, but you'll see uh, all the red parts there uh, are certainly uh, below two meters. And in Louisiana, the, the sea will come up and uh, will remove some of the sediments in the bayou that protect uh, Louisiana from storm surges. Now the real issue for sea level rise is not that it's just slowly going to rise and that we can wait 30 or 40 years and fall asleep watching it rise. Each time it rises you increase the odds that the next storm will have a storm surge that will go further inland than the last one. And it will increase the odds that there will be saltwater intrusion into your aquifers. So that's the worry about sea level rise. Now the question is, how, how should, this is just one of the impacts of, uh, of climate change that people are worrying about, but, but it's the easiest one for decision makers and planners to understand. Uh, it's visualizable. So there's been more progress in thinking about what to do about sea level rise than there is about, let us say, the destruction of local ecosystems or the changes in them. So another conference that we organized was held in Venice and it was to survey what cities around the world who worry about these things are actually trying to do uh, to adapt to the climate change that we predict in the future. So Venice, which is a beautiful city protected in a lagoon 20, 30 miles long, protected by barrier islands, that'll be familiar to you, with only three entrances to the lagoon. Venice, about 10 to 15 years ago, decided to put large gates up that they would basically, most of the time, keep on the ocean bottom. But when there was a big storm expected, they would raise these gates and it would hold off the high water and protect the city. Okay? And uh, we did an analysis for them and we agreed, ultimately, that by the time uh, sea level rise reaches 80 centimeters, they will have to keep the gates closed full time. Okay? Now the Netherlands is a country that's dealt with sea level rise for its entire existence, last 500 years, and so they've gotten onto this problem, and probably leading the world in ocean-facing technology, but they just announced this year a 100-year plan for dealing with it, and they're going to spend about 1.7 to 2 billion euros a year, and they're going to strengthen every ocean-facing uh, piece of infrastructure that they have. Okay? 100 years, so that's uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars. We also looked at the wonderful Venice's sister city, the wonderful city of Alexandria, and the picture on the right will show you the Nile Delta, and the blue parts are those that are expected to be inundated. And uh, there the, the problem will be salt water intrusion. 
And that, the Nile Delta is still the richest agricultural region in the Mediterranean basis, a basin. And uh, there you can see that Egypt doesn't have, its coastline's about the same length as Holland. Egypt doesn't have the capacity to, financial or otherwise, to do what Holland does. But there are about 80 million people that depend on it. So, bottom line, we expect about the warming rate to be about twice in the coming decades what we saw in the last 40 years, twice the last rate. And the question is, is there anything we can do to slow things down? Not stop them, but at least slow them down. Give people more time to adjust to the climate change that's coming and give people more time to work on the extremely hard uh, carbon fossil fuel problem. And there are a few things that you can do. And that was the basis of uh, Hillary Clinton's initiative. It starts by understanding that carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that we're putting out. In fact, there are things like methane and refrigerants called hydrofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide and, and ozone. And together, these other gases that we also are responsible for are responsible for about 40% of the total warming rate. Okay? So we can take the edge off climate change. We can slow things down. And the reason is that these other gases have shorter atmospheric lifetimes. Methane's about 10 years. So if you do something now, you'll see an effect in 10 years' time. It'll slow things down. The black carbon warming will go away in two weeks if you could stop it. Okay? So if you were to work on those, you wouldn't stop all of the warming, but you'd slow down the rate. And that's a good thing. It's a practical problem. We ought to do what we can. So the hydrofluorocarbons, the refrigerants, uh, are one of the most rapidly growing uh, potential greenhouse gases. On a per molecule basis, they're about 10,000 times uh, more potent than carbon dioxide. So it doesn't take much to cause a fair amount of warming. We've already dealt with their relatives, the chlorofluorocarbons, which were in your ozone spray cans and were causing the de depletion of the ozone layer. And the Montreal Protocol of 1988 has basically eliminated their usage. And uh, that's fine. The ozone hole is on the way to being cured, as NASA observations will tell you. Uh, but what we didn't realize at the time was that the CFCs were greenhouse gases, just like their replacement, the HFCs. And the CFCs, if we'd left them in the atmosphere, we'd have already uh, gotten a few uh, fractions of a degree more warming than we currently have. So by getting rid of the, those spray cans, we actually helped the warming problem and were cooler as a result. And we can deal with the HFCs, which were their replacement, in the same way by extending the Montreal Protocol. That's something that can be done. And it would reduce warming, and we know that we can do it because we've done it once already, even though nobody knew that we were doing it. So methane, that's a biggie. Uh, it's natural gas. Uh, there are natural sources for it, and there are human sources. And methane is basically created by uh, biology uh, organisms that like to live in, in depleted oxygen atmospheres with plenty of nutrients. So they grow and they produce methane. And uh, so they landfills. Rice paddies are a big source of methane, and beef cattle. It's a, you know, the stomach of a cow is warm, it's nutritive, and there's not much oxygen. And it also comes from industrial sources. And the best thing to do with methane, 23 times as potent, is use it as a fuel, use it as natural gas. But if you let it, if, you, if it leaks from your power plant into the atmosphere, it's going to cause 23 times more warming than if you burn it. And much of the U.S.'s improved position in, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions in the last three or four years has been due to the transition from coal burning to method to natural gas in some of our electrical power plants. So that's 
And then finally, the other remark is that the people who manage uh, these other short-lived climate pollutants, we are, they already know how to do it, actually. They're air pollution control agencies, and every country has one now. And uh, so you can do this by managing air pollution. And the countries that do it will have a double benefit because they will cure their health and agricultural problems. At the same time, they're helping us by reducing the warming rate. Okay? So, and here's a little graph that was published in The Economist magazine. It was done uh, a while back by, uh, about a, at the end of uh, this year, last year, by Drew Schindel and our colleagues at NASA. And they just did a bunch of computations for the warming rate between now and 2070. And the straight blue line is business as usual. And uh, if we continue on at 2070, we'll have gone 2.7 degrees. Okay? Uh, if, for example, we were to reduce carbon dioxide at the maximum rate that I, everybody thinks is possible, which is the California rate and the UK rate, and, the theoretical rate, then you get the bottom line. But by reducing methane, you come down, methane and black carbon, you come down with a better uh, outcome. And remember how big three quarters of a degree is and what it did already in the Arctic. So saving a half a degree or three quarters of a degree is a major achievement. And it makes, makes the problem, gives us more time to deal with the problem, but doesn't completely solve it, if in fact there's going to be a solution. So at the end of the day then, what we've got is a new incentive for international discussions on this, because reducing these short-lived climate pollutants is a win for Asia, public health, and it's a win for the world. And so this is just a picture of the same atmospheric brown cloud, and then some of the rivers that depend in Asia on, uh, on the melting snows. This, therefore, was the reason then that uh, Hillary Clinton on February 16th announced in one of the first, uh, one of the few international initiatives the United States has taken in the climate arena, and that is to create an international coalition of advanced and developing countries that will work together using air pollution control mechanisms to both clean the air and uh, reduce the global warming rate. And over the years uh, since then, a whole bunch of countries have signed up and they're listed at the bottom. Uh, the World Bank has just developed, has added. And so it's a, basically a technology and knowledge transfer mechanism by which the advanced countries will uh, work to accelerate the developing countries' efforts to control their own air pollution. Okay? The bottom line, this coalition does not yet include India and China, and may not. That will depend on international diplomacy that's going on at this point. But it obviously is a constructive step, and uh, it is uh, something that we can do now to improve the life for our children 40 years from now and get a handle on the problem and prove to people that you consider it seriously, that it's a serious enough problem that we should take action. Now, whatever we can do that seems feasible, we should be doing, and that's part of its credibility. So, in summary then, uh, if you listen to all of this and you ask yourself, well, how am we going to help our children avoid the worst aspects of climate change that's coming, and what have we said? world ought to agree on climate strategies. It's got to deploy clean energy technologies global. It should manage all the, green, all the greenhouse gases and air pollution together. It should replenish the world's tropical forests. And I didn't talk about that, but there's a significant progress that's occurring already. We need new technologies. California's analysis showed we can't do it with existing technologies. And finally, we have to prepare for the changes that are coming. So, thank you.
It's a grim topic, but we're not entirely helpless. And I think that is the most important thing that I've learned by, about thinking about all these aspects of the problem. There are things that we can do. So, now, uh, we have questions. I think I see one hand raised. Uh, if you'd speak into the microphone so everybody can hear the question, then we can go ahead. Well, the comment I read just today that Brazil is ahead of the game on the, re on the slowing down of the destruction of the rainforest, which is a very positive thing. Yes, I, I read the same article today and I was very pleased. And I have to tell you that NASA played a significant, on my watch, played a significant role in that because we did, helped, well, we collaborated with Brazil and produced the first objective assessment of the rate of deforestation of the whole rainforest, which could only be taken by aircraft and by NASA, by satellites. And at that time, in the mid 80s and 90s, NASA took the lead, but now Brazil does a first class job of monitoring its own rainforests. And clearly, they have made progress. And uh, the, the other countries that are doing it are, are Peru uh, and Norway is leading a big consortium on managing the forest. Okay, now I have one question here and then one way in the back. And so, but you need a, you need a microphone. And it'll take a moment. Bear. Okay, we'll go in the back first and then you can bring it. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, hi. Um, I just wondered, uh, the melting of the glaciers, I'm assuming that's fresh water, and what is the impact of that going into the, uh, into the oceans and the salinity of the oceans yeah. and the wildlife in the oceans? Well, the glaciers, well, two things. When you melt, when there's an accelerated melt rate of the glaciers, uh, for the first few years, um, you see an increase in water flow and in the rivers. And the decision makers think, oh, that's great, you've got plenty of water. And then the glaciers go away. And then you don't have so much. Uh, all of the water eventually gets into the oceans or into the climate system through evaporation. And so the glaciers do have uh, a measurable impact on the sea level rise. It's a number that scientists try to compute. It's not the critical issue. Uh, the glaciers are an indicator because it's occurring worldwide. NASA did a study of tropical glaciers at the high mountains in the tropics, and they found every mountain Every glacier was retreating worldwide. It's most important as an indicator, a canary in the mine, that shows that these effects are occurring worldwide and without uh, too many exceptions. Uh, we had one here, and then uh, I've got one there and then one here. I'm gonna try to be, have good geographical coverage here, but I'm afraid it's gonna be like that plot. It'll go up and down and so forth. Please go ahead. As we travel through the West, we see a lot of clean energy wind farms with the farms underneath them. We don't see it on the east side of the United States. What's the problem? Uh, you don't, see, well. Uh, the wind turbines. Yeah, if you go, if you go through, uh, there's a wind alley in the United States uh, from the Great Plains, right? And the Great Plains uh, have a long fetch and the winds have an opportunity to develop. So this is why for example, Texas, which is one of our biggest fossil fuel states, is also one of our biggest wind energy uh, producers because the wind is there. And uh, so Texas now is an energy state. I mean, think of it, energy is energy. That's the important thing, not whether it's CO2, or carbon, not whether it's fossil fuels or what. Energy is energy. And uh, so I think that they have a, a great wind resource, and in the east, uh, they don't. Eventually, and, and the other aspect of things is that in order to deal with wind energy and solar energy, it varies, it's intermittent. It goes up and it goes down, and the electric companies uh, have to keep the voltage just about the same or every machine we've got breaks down. So the question of how to deal with a highly variable source uh, is very hard to deal with, and it involves massive computerization of the electrical grid so that on a minute by minute basis you can balance out where the energy is coming to and going to. And uh, 
we don't have that kind of uh, power network, but Texas has gone a significant way to create one within its own borders. So uh, I said, uh, what was it, over here, I think the lady in blue, please. What is the effect of fracking that's going on in Pennsylvania and New York and so forth as far as methane is concerned? Uh, what is the effect of fracking? The biggest worry, I think, is that you're injecting water into uh, high hydrocarbon-rich regions and trying to break up the hydrocarbon particles into something you can use. And the danger is that some of this polluted water will get into aquifers. I think that's the big danger. Um, but the main effect is that methane is highly advantageous to use, but it won't be if we allow it to escape into the atmosphere. So the main thing to do is to be exceptionally rigorous on controlling. It's to everybody's benefit not to waste it in the atmosphere, let's put it that way. So the biggest effort there is to control methane release. Time for two more quick questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, okay. Right. I'm f f and then I owe you and that's it, okay? Because you had your hand up first and I forgot. Dr. Kennel, uh, regarding this um, agreement that's being reached and all these, what is the science that's going to drive what people do to change it? You know, the p diplomats make one kind of thing, but what's the science underneath it and how is the scientific community going to be involved in this movement towards saving the earth? I think the role of the scientific community is first of all to arrive at as complete and an objective discussion as we can about what's causing the problem and what the impacts are going to be. And that's where we should work. Um, the choices and to provide options about what to do. And that this, this talk is are backed up by science, and here we provided a few options. You know, you can control the hydrofluorocarbons, you can look after methane, you can work on your air pollution and your black carbon, and you will make a difference. And it's, it's for us to say that, and even to advocate that people do it, but it's not for us to say what this particular government or region ought to do. That's a, a political decision that has to balance out many other concerns. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, the science has been there pretty much all along. But I do think that the, the solution of the problem is not going to, going to be found by science. Well, it'll, it'll be proposed by scientists, but it will not be carried out by scientists. I think we have a role to play, but uh, as things develop, I think we'll be seen as having a smaller and smaller influence on the overall issue, and that the issues will be uh, about social acceptance of new ways of doing things, uh, legislation, regulations, uh, and there um, I think the science will do what it did, do what it does, but not the, the big issues are going to be beyond climate science. Well, I think in your answer to her, you actually said something that kind of ties into what I wanted to know, but I just wanted to know if uh, in terms of preventing dangerous climate control, um, if there are alternatives to government regulations and rules um, in actually preventing it altogether. Yes, um, I think there is. There's plenty of room. We've seen... Uh, I think we can agree that international negotiations, we have to have them, but they're not an avenue to rapid progress. Uh, I think uh, making the case for renewable fuels uh, and letting people try it where it makes sense to them and give it a try, I think much of this problem is going to be solved at the non-governmental level. And I, and I think this is, by the way, this is where science can can also play a role because we can say, if you do it this way, it will benefit. And uh, science can also, on the regulatory side, um, we've made huge progress in controlling air pollution, for example. London took about 25 years. LA's got it more or less under control. 
Mexico City has done so since about 1990, and that is done through a combination of government regulations and then um, various uh, private groups providing the technology for doing it. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I don't think you can do it. In many cases, you can't do it without government setting the framework, but if you were to ignore private initiative, you'd never get any place. On that note, let's thank our speaker.